you'll lose some points, but yeah. Problem one and part A of problem six. That will not help you at all, so might as well just turn it in front. <laughs> yes. Okay. Anything else? Any questions on it? Yeah. What do you got, Sam? Number seven. Number seven. I think that's the one with the reaction. Oh, God. Okay. Okay, so we had some, we had a platypus, platypus battle going on, right? Derive the residual marginal revenue curve. Okay, what did you guys do? So um, break it up. Let's talk about, let's kind of work through this in slow motion. I like your, link, your lingo. It sounds like you're getting on to the, to the gist of it here. So we got some market demand curve. Uh, what am I trying to do here? Quantity. So break it up meaning what? Break up the quantity of this. OK, so we start off with, what's their demand curve here? 1,000 minus 2Q. 1,000 minus 2Q. And so we break up their quantities into the two firms. What do we got, a QA and a QS, I'm guessing? Yeah. So that equals 1,000 minus 2QA plus QS. We can distribute the two through. Um, so what makes it residual? Why do we call it residual? After the other person moves. So it's really just putting a... I, I like the way the textbook kind of poked fun at it, saying, and guess what? It's the residual. Did you guys catch that in the, I don't know if you read that section on the residual. Surprise, surprise, residual marginal revenue, residual demand. So all we're doing is we're thinking about what's the demand for my product? It's the leftover after whatever this guy did. Yeah, but my question is on part E. Oh, E. I'm sorry, I thought you said B. Solve for Sydney's profit maximizing level of output and Adelaide's profit maximizing level of output. Okay, how do we tackle this? <laughs> you yes. Now, <laughs> one thing that's a little um, unique is that you might tend to want to set those equal to each other and then the math won't work out. Is that what you did by chance? Uh -huh. I think that's a natural thing to want to do is to kind of set them equal, but you need to plug one into the other one. Yes, yep, to, to solve for that one. So you're plugging in. So just like, um, was that you, Chuck, that was speaking? That plug the one reaction function into the other. And then that'll uh, allow you to solve for um, the, uh, because then you've got it down to one, uh, one quantity. Yes, yeah. So on the, uh, you got this solution, did you write the solutions down mm -hmm. in there? So, 133. Yeah, so subbing it right into, directly into the other residual marginal revenue function. Okay. Anything else on that? Okay, why don't we turn those in? Yes. I think it's more kind of like a, I guess a real world question. Like okay. some of these they have like a lot of decimals and stuff. And so like if you're applying that to like an actual real situation with quantity and stuff where you can't really have a decimal with quantity, like how do you go about that? Like do you like would they just drop it if they Okay, so real world <laughs> you're getting into the kind of the here's what we think of theory, here's how the real world. We probably don't have um, this simple of reaction functions real world. And a lot of this might come down to kind of gut feeling. But the, this model, the economic model, helps us show how the behaviors work. Yeah. OK, good question. All right. What's that, John? 
Yeah, yeah, even driving a demand curve, and then there's um, estimation error and you know, all of that stuff. So um, a lot of this material, I think I got it this time. A lot of this material um, gives you little insights into uh, how the real world might react and, and kind of helps you formulate solutions in the real world because you kind of think back to how what the outcome of that model was. Um, so um, sometimes we get into uh, more applied stuff. Um, when, when we get into the capstone course and some other things, we'll be applying. You guys will be kind of gathering data and, and those, I say you guys who are business econ majors um, will get into a more applied um, framework. Uh, and I have some exercises that we could tackle in here but I don't think we're going to have enough time so we'll save those for a different course. Okay so <laughs> game theory. I don't know if I should even, um, yeah let's just pass this up. I think we're just going to kind of jump right in <coughs> to a problem. Sam. Uh, so let's take a look first of all at the Grocery Mart uh, food for you. Uh, the material that we're going to derive, I'll, I'll uh, mention highlights. Uh, a lot of it is uh, review from principles class in terms of what a Nash equilibrium is and dominant strategy. So I think we'll just kind of jump in and you can see right away we, we jump right into a, well, at least something different than what, what we covered in principles class. We mostly stuck to a two by two framework and we've got a three by three uh, with the grocery mart here. So two grocery stores uh, in a small city are considering ways to update their stores. Each store can build a new store, remodel its existing store, or leave it as is in current condition. The game is shown below. <laughs> Food for you, payoffs are listed uh, before the comma, and grocery marts after. Payoffs are listed are the store's annual profits in thousands. So same uh, um, notation we did before, whatever you're measuring to the left of the payoff matrix. This person, uh, X and Y, so that it's X payoff, comma, so if this is 40, 60, the first entry is always the player or agent off to the left, the second entry is the uh, agent up top. All right, so let's just dig right in. Are there any dominant strategies for either food for you or grocery mart? Explain. Dominant strategy, let's talk about what that is. Anybody want to venture a definition? Where you're better off. Yes, a little more. You're better off. In all the options. In all the options, okay, let's refine that a little bit more. You're better off. <laughs> What's that? no matter what the other ones are, good. That's kind of putting it all together. So uh, it's a strategy combination. In this case, we just have a choice of one of these options uh, such that the firm is better off no matter what the other guy does. So is there any here? This is where you kind of have to train your eyeballs how to read these things a bit. Are there any here? <laughs> Remodel existing store for Grocery Mart. So as you, I guess we'll go ahead and try to recreate this thing a little bit. <coughs> so we got build new store, remodel, or leave as is, build, remodel, leave as is. We've got uh, food and Grocery Mart. Okay. So one quick and dirty way to 
to do that is to train your eye to look at the second number. And you can do this either way starting, but um, train your eye to look at the second number and run down the columns and see if that dominates all the other ones, right? So look for the column with the big numbers and that'll kind of help get you guided. So let me throw these numbers in here real quick. Um, does Fujimore, you said Grocery Mart had the dominant strategy, does Fujimore have one? No. I have a quick question actually. Okay. Uh, so do you have to move through remodel existing store if you're going to build a new one? No. What do you mean? Uh, no, there's no uh, relationship between the two that one's conditional upon so the other. So you can go from leave store as is to building a new store. Right. So wouldn't food for you have a dominant strategy? Moving from this is kind of a uh, what did we call that when you have uh, you're just going to choose one. Kind of had a loose term for, which brings yeah. up other issues that we'll get to later. Anybody remember that? Yeah, what'd you say? Single shot, Single shot or one shot. So this is a one shot game. You're going to pick one of these. Certainly, this is status quo currently, leave as is. But so do we leave as is, remodel, or build? <laughs> okay, so by eyeballing these second numbers, 400 is greater than 2 and 150, 450 is greater than 300 and 175, 350 is, so you can kind of quickly start to move through the matrix if you train your eyes on which payoff is which. Same thing over here for Fujimore, the first entry, and of course they're making choices this way, so you might want to pick on the big one first, yep, that dominates both of those, dominates both of those, whoops. This one, they'd rather do this one instead of this one. So that's not a dominant, he, uh, Fujimore does not have a dominant strategy. <coughs> okay, so what about B, a dominated strategy? So for who, for which company? How does this one play out? We can kind of jump for potentially getting towards solving the game and finding some Nash equilibrium. Would it be the one where they're evening out completely no matter what? <coughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, if Fujimore chooses to leave the store, isn't that what you said, Chelsea? So is, how does that compare to the other choices? Between the other two. So look at that, see what you can get from comparing the leave the store as is. Uh, no, I want to think about just his choices, just, just his or her or its choices. Or it's a shareholder group of a bunch of people, the food you more store. So 150, 175, 350, and then compare that to the other choices. <coughs> What's that? No, no adding. Let's think about grocery mart. So what you should be thinking is zeroing in on this choice. If I choose to leave the store as is, how does that compare to my other two choices now? Now, one thing um, to bear in mind as we work through these games is can food you more see grocery marts payoffs? Yes. yes. 
under these assumptions of the model, yes. So when these two are acting strategically, they see the whole payoff matrix. And so they've done investigation, they've gathered data, they kind of know their competitor, right? Or they know them as best as they, as they can. <clears throat> they gathered information. So anyway, our baseline assumption is that both players see what you're seeing. And so whenever you start to uh, try to solve a game, just remember that they can change their behavior based on what the other one's payoffs are going to be as well. So given that idea, what is Grocery Mart going to pick? Well, first of all, you said we in part A, what did we determine? They had uh, a dominant strategy of remodel. So they're going to choose to remodel. So what should Food You Mart, Food You, Food for You, food for you what should they choose knowing that information? Remodel. Remodel. So the dominant strategy in the car A, <coughs> that one, same in the middle? Yes. And the reason is, is that for Grocery Mart, it's always the best strategy, regardless of what um, food, <laughs> food for you did. So um, let me write this out a little more formula, formal, formally for part A. Checking for dominant strategy. This is kind of the shorthand notation that I was accustomed to that we did in principles class too. So uh, dominant strategy for uh, grocery mark. If what we want to do is check if the other guy does this, what should I do? If the other guy does this, what should I do? So if the food for you chooses to build, then the grocery mark should choose to remodel because 400 is greater than the other two. If food for you chooses to remodel, then grocery mark should still choose to remodel. If food, food for you chooses to leave it as is, then Grocery Mart should still remodel. So what makes it a dominant strategy is that no matter what food for you does, the choice is always the same. We're going to choose to remodel. So therefore, uh, Grocery Mart has a dominant strategy of remodeling. Chelsea. So let's just kind of work through <laughs> if um, if food you more uh, believes that grocery mart will leave it as is. <laughs> uh, what should food for you choose to leave it right? Um, So under no circumstances, is it better for them to leave it as is? Oh, I see here. That, yeah, if food, when Fujimore believes you. Grocery Mart will leave his own store in its current state, Fujimore is better off building, building a new store. Yeah, 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 yeah that's. No, that's not. That's Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's why I was screwed up. OK, so yes. So under no circumstances are they going to leave it as is, so it's dominated. So you can kind of like wipe that one out for them. And then you've got it narrowed down to just two choices. So it dominated means like under no circumstances? Yes. Yep. So part B. A dominated strategy is 
one that will never be chosen given any choices by the other agent or the competitor in this case. So what we can do is, well, in fact, we can do it like this. Let me just show you the whole thing then. So if G chooses, if Grocery Mart chooses to build, then Food You More should choose what? Remodel. And this would probably be the good way to work through it, by the way, to, to start to narrow things down. If the Grocery Mart chooses to remodel, then who should choose what? Remodel. And if the grocery mart chooses to leave as is, then who you more should do build. Therefore, uh, L is dominated for uh, food anymore. See? We never no choose. We, no matter what the other one chooses, we never choose it, so it's dominated. Which kind of just helps you solve the problem. It's like, okay, this whole this whole row is kind of off the table as we start to solve things. By the way, these, these matrices could get 5 by 5, 5 by 12. It, it could be as big or as small as you want. So by learning how to look for dominated and dominant strategies, it can be more help you quickly solve the game. Always start off with the dominant strategy. Because if you narrow down one column, then we've pretty much wiped out this column, we've wiped out this column, now we've wiped out this column, we're down to this. These two strategies is really the only thing we've got. Saw a bunch of hands here. Tell them. Um, the thing you got to be careful of is uh, exploring all other options prior to calling them dominant or dominated. So if I understood your question right, you were starting to narrow those down like these are dominated for... Well, it's not maybe like they were since they would always choose to remodel. And they're not. Okay. So you don't want to think about these as being dominated at the, under this definition. They have a dominant, but I wouldn't call these dominated because depending on, uh, well, maybe I should, no matter what they do, they're never choosing these. So I know we're okay. Those are dominated. Yes. Mike. Here's my recommendation. Memorize doing this. Be very systematic at how you approach these problems. So, in fact, we weren't very systematic here. You should do the same exercise for if G chooses this, which we kind of did here. So we did end up doing both. Do this exercise for both players. Whether it's a two by two, whether it's a four by four. You'll start to see things right away, but you might overlook something. You might your eyeball might have went to one payoff and the other. It, it takes a while to start absorbing these things. So try to be systematic about it. I'm going to say, like, as far as having a better payoff, regardless of what you pick, um, I mean, Grocery Mart has a better payoff than the other two options, regardless if they were built correctly. Right. So, well, it has a better, it has a dominant strategy. Yeah, that's strategy. the dominant strategy.
Yes. So was well, the strategy just <clears throat> choosing the one that pays the least regardless? Well, let, let's take a look at that. If, uh, the, if they choose this, um, that's not the best payoff for them though, right? So we've started to narrow things no, down. No, they might have a choice possibly of getting this or this if the other guy does different choices. I'm sitting here. Let, let's just keep working through. I think part of what might be in our next part here, C, Nash equilibrium. What was the idea of Nash? We covered that in the last chapter. Neither player would choose something else. Neither player would choose something else. So nobody wants to change given what the other one, taking as given what the other one's done. So it's a stable situation. So let's go to this one since this is the biggest payoff. This is the guy um, with, uh, uh, with, the big, um, with the dominant strategy. Is this choice set of Food for you choosing to remodel, grocery mart choosing to remodel. Is that a Nash equilibrium? Yes, why? They both get the highest payoff. So it happens to be the highest thing on the board, so it makes this one kind of easy. But um, taking turns here, we look at food. Would food for you want to switch? No, 450 is greater than 300. 450 is greater than 175. He's set. Would Grocery Mart like to switch? Well, 450 is greater than 175. 450 is greater than 300. She's set. So Nash equilibrium. Will they get the highest payoff given the other person's choice? Taking as given what the other one's choosing. Okay. <laughs> now, like I said, this one's a little misleading because it's the only payoff on the board um, where both parties are getting the best. So this one's kind of loaded. They're usually more fun than this where there's a little, a little choice of uh, maybe one's not quite as high. Like on these off diagonals, um, that could have been. So uh, because of this situation, neither one of these are going to pay off better. Now, uh, speaking of the diagonal thing, I gave you a little hint in principles class. If there's multiple Nash equilibrium, where will you find them? On the diagonals. So the only places to check, if you were to just kind of, uh, we could have put these numbers on the board and said, check for Nash equilibrium. Like, don't check for dominant strategy, you know, but I recommend you do do this first, by the way. But I'm just saying, in theory, we could have went to each cell and started checking for Nash equilibrium. And then we're just saying, would food for you want to switch? If we were at this solution, would food for you like to switch? And the answer is yes, because 400 is greater than 350, it's not a Nash equilibrium. Okay, well now this one sounds pretty good. Would food for you like to switch? No, that's the best one. So is it a Nash equilibrium? No, because we've got to check the other person too. It's not stable unless both parties don't wish to change their answer. And so uh, the grocery mart here would definitely like to change because 400 is greater than 150. So it's not a Nash equilibrium. So that's how we check for stability of the solution. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next one, unless there's any last wrap up with that. Okay, can you just make sure that I'm checking for a dominant strategy, right? Sure. Okay, so F chooses to build F chooses to, row. okay, so kind of delete these. Right. And then right. you choose whichever ones you would have the highest number in. Right. It's not based on the other one. Like nope. They're winning money. Nope. And that's why I kind of play on these words. So if we had some inside information and we knew for sure that the food for you was choosing to build, what would be your best response you just to get that? The highest number yep. And that's the best response. And so we're just looking at best responses, taking as given that the other one's choosing that for, for whatever reason. Okay, uh, next one here. Suppose that two motorcycle manufacturers, Honda and Suzuki, are considering uh, offering 10-year full coverage warranties for their new motorcycles. Although the warranties are expensive to offer, 
Uh, it could be disastrous for one firm if the other does not offer the warranty while its competitor does. Let's assume that the payoffs for the firms are as follows. Profits are in millions with Honda's profits in red uh, before the comma and Suzuki's in blue after it. We don't have reds and blues here, so your textbook would, but um, if the game is played once, one shot, what is the outcome? So, So I'd go check for dominant. If it's played once, do we see where it's going? So we got Honda, Suzuki, <coughs> offer, don't offer, offer, don't offer. <coughs> what do you got? Offer? Okay, so we're having offer, offer. <coughs> okay, so checking for dominant strategy, let's work through that together. Hopefully you tried it on your own already. If Honda chooses to not offer, what should Suzuki do? Offer. If Honda chooses to offer, what should Suzuki do? Offer. No? Got to train your eyeballs. Let's go back and redo that one. And in fact, let's write it out. If Honda chooses to offer, then Suzuki should choose. So if Honda chooses to, I guess I did it backwards before, but it, no. If Honda chooses to offer, we blank this out, what should Suzuki choose? Offer. 20 is greater than 10. So if Honda chooses to not offer, Suzuki should. So if uh, Honda's now choosing this one, what should Suzuki do? Offer. 120 is greater than 50. Therefore, uh, Suzuki has dominant strategy. Now, let's do the same exercise, even though we could start to move in a different direction, for Honda. Then we always want to, if we're wearing our Honda cap, we want to think about our competitor. Well, what if that sucker Suzuki chooses to offer? What should I do? Offer. 20 is greater than 10. And what if that sucker Suzuki chooses to don't offer? What should I do? Offer. Both have a dominant strategy. Both would be offering. Now, is it a Nash equilibrium? No. no. Why? Because either party still has a better benefit by offering. Yeah, there's higher numbers. There's higher numbers elsewhere. They would. But we got to take as given. So it is a Nash. Okay, Nash equilibrium. We better write this out, I think. It sounds like we don't have it off the top of our heads well enough. Your textbook doesn't, uh, in fact, let me tell you what the textbook definition is. I think I like mine for solving this type of uh, payoff. But they, so Nash equilibrium, this is from chapter 11. An equilibrium in which each firm is doing the best it can conditional on the actions taken by its competitors. So if that works better for you, the flow of it, I like mine a little better. Neither agent wishes to change choice, or more formally, we'd call this the strategy. So neither agent wishes to change their strategy <clears throat> taking as given the other's choice. That's kind of the hard part to remember, is that this is really an assumption. 
we're not we're not trying to tell a story of well that wouldn't be good for them or something. We're just saying, hey, it is what it is. Suppose they choose this. What should I do, or would I want to switch? If we're stuck here, should I switch? And we already said that this is a dominant strategy. So would Suzuki want to switch? No, because 20 is greater than 10. Notice how we're just undoing exactly what we did here. Would Honda like to switch? No, 20 is greater than 10. That's a Nash equilibrium. So neither party wants to switch. Taking is given what the other has done. Now this is an interesting result because you guys pointed it right out. We have a better solution for both of them, but this is still an equilibrium. It's still a stable uh, position to be in. So this was all part of the John Nash, beautiful mind, a little different than, uh, than maybe some classical economics. Um, now, the interesting thing that comes up then is how could they possibly get to this equilibrium? Collusion and cooperative behavior. But then we get back to the models of, are we playing a repeated game? Is this a one-shot game? So am I really, if this guy's my competitor, even if we met for breakfast over coffee and said, hey, let's both don't offer, once it actually happens and this is our payoffs, are these guys really gonna be good with their offer? Probably not in a one-shot game if they're true competitors. Now, if they were best friends growing up and they had this deep relationship, you notice how I'm telling stories that don't belong in this economic model. That's where we need to detach ourselves as economists to think, I want to tell a real world story, but at the same time, I want to understand some of the underpinnings of the incentives at hand. Then you can add those little fluff stories uh, as part of it, but don't confuse that with the economic model. Did you have a question, Michael, or comment? Okay. So, both parties have a dominant strategy. Um, now, is this a Nash equilibrium then? Yes. yes? Because either party still has a better opportunity. Yeah, each party has a better opportunity. Taking is given what the other one's doing. So again, would Honda like to switch their answer, taking as given that Suzuki's not offering it? Yes, 120 is greater than 50. So it's not stable. It's not a stable equilibrium. Um, Honda would like to switch, and turns out Suzuki in this case would like to switch as well. You can tell that this way when they have a dominant strategy, strategy is to choose offer it. Yeah, in this case. So anytime both firms have a dominant strategy, whatever that is, by definition, the way we just undid it, that's for sure going to be an Ash equilibrium. Okay? And then as we said, you can always check the off diagonal one, maybe to double check on a, on a test or a homework. And then we saw that this was not an Nash equilibrium. Now this has a special form to it. Does anybody remember what we called this game when it has payoffs structured this way? It's a special game that's actually probably the most famous game of all the game theory. It's done in a number of different disciplines. The what? The prisoner's dilemma, yes. So this is the prisoner's dilemma. Um, <clears throat> the dilemma is that there's a payoff that makes both parties better off, but each one's better off by defecting and not cooperating. So there's a cooperative solution available, but each party has incentive to not cooperate. That's the dilemma uh, faced by the prisoners. In the original prisoner's dilemma, it was two criminals. They're separated, Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, each one's offered uh, a reduced sentence if they narc on the other, uh, their other partner. You know, are they going to confess or are they going to deny that they did the crime? If they deny, they get there's not enough evidence for them to be convicted of the crime, so they're probably going to be let off. But uh, if they confess the crime, they'll get a better sentence. And so they end up both having to confess, potentially, or that's their dilemma. Now, <clears throat> the prisoner's dilemma, a lot of these games are uh, done in an experimental environment where we use human beings and we kind of present different cases. We don't show them a box like this. We just kind of say, here's what you get if you cooperate. Here's what you get if you don't. 
And, but, you know, here's the payoff if you do, they might use money, they might use food, they might use, you know, whatever. You can set up this experiment and uh, see what the results are. And it's usually a mixed bag. Um, there, there'll be some people that attempt to cooperate, you know, that confuses the economists. They're like, well, wait a second, if you're rational, if you really understand this, you should be defecting every time. So that's where it gets into some of the interesting topics of uh, chapter 17 in this book on experimental stuff and human behavior. And we saw a little bit of that with the altruism part, too. Okay, so <coughs> did we do everything here? Oh, no, let's, uh, so that was a long-winded answer to part A. Uh, suppose the game is repeated three times. Will the outcome in A uh, change? <coughs> no. Why? So, say that again. I'm just saying, like, if there's no change in how the game is played, if it's just like played more times, they're still going to offer regardless, knowing that that they have a chance to escape. <coughs> so, what we want to think of when we get into repeated game is backwards induction. It'll be sometimes helpful to think about your last move. What would players be wanting to do on the last move? Is that any different? So if this is a cooperative solution, and maybe we can try to say, well, I'll, we're going to play this three times, so maybe I'll choose to not do it on the first one, and maybe they'll be smart enough, and we'll catch, catch it up on the second one, and then we'll cooperate. Um, but if we played this 100 times, Maybe we could do that for a while, and then uh, we start to think about that very last time. The very last time we play it, we're back to kind of the one-shot setting, right? Where this is the last time we've been cooperating. Boom, I can make a big payoff if I cheat. And then that player starts thinking, well, if he's going to do it on the last time, maybe I'll do it on the second to last time, because he's pretty smart, and I'll be thinking the same thing he is. And so it kind of unravels backwards. So. Um, with these games, <coughs> um, thinking about uh, the last time you play it uh, might help you figure out how the, <coughs> the logical way to play the, um, the intermediate rounds as well. <coughs> and so in this case, it would be that. Okay, so part C is a little more complicated. Um, suppose that the game is infinitely repeated and Suzuki and Honda have formed an agreement not to offer warranties to their customers. Each firm plans to use, uh, <coughs> plans the use of a grim trigger strategy to encourage compliance with the agreement. Uh, at what level of D would Honda be indifferent about keeping the agreement versus cheating on it? Okay, so this is a loaded one that we're not going to have time to uh, get through all of today, but let's think about some of the issues. <coughs> Does it change things when we're playing it indefinitely? Yeah, it really does, right? Because if we're playing it a finite number of times, that's one thing, but if we don't know when it's going to end, if this is going to go on forever, you've always got time to make up for a cheater or to punish a cheater or to see if things could come back. It's, you don't feel like it's uh, everything's all set nice and tidy because if you're playing it infinitely, um, whatever our time periods are, if it's day by day, month by month, you're going to stretch that equation out for a long ways. And so now incentives have changed a bit on how we might uh, play the game. And we need to start thinking about the expected payoff. So... Um, and this is where we'll get into more detail than what we did in principles class, by the way. So with infinite time horizon, <coughs> we need to <coughs> think about 
expected payoffs. <coughs> expected payoffs and discounted payment streams. So, you guys can check that out. We're going to call it a day there. <laughs>